it says on here it's recording. I don't think it is yet. So I'll just give it like five seconds because it says it's loading on here. There, now we're good. Hello, uh, Hi, everybody. My name is Wabgeesha Grace. I'm a member of the Bear Clan. I'm from Wasaxing First Nation, which is near Perry Sound, Ontario, on Georgian Bay. I currently live in Sudbury, Ontario, uh, the traditional territory of the Tikmikshing Nishnabek, which is under the Robinson Huron Treaty. Uh, I am 41 years old, and I am very honored to be here with you all tonight. I'm uh, very encouraged by these conversations you've been having uh, to lift everybody's spirits during the pandemic. I commend you for that. I think it's really important to try to uh, foster and bolster a sense of community, especially during this difficult time. And I think it's really encouraging uh, that you've all turned to storytelling and to gathering and to visiting to, to lift other people's spirits. And I think that's a really great initiative. And uh, you know, I hold my hands up to you all for, for doing this. And it's a great honor for me to, to be a part of this tonight. And um, you know, just, I see young people like you uh, blazing these trails and doing really incredible things. And I'm, I'm very thankful and I'm very hopeful for the future because um, I am familiar with, uh, with many of you and, and the work that you do and, and you make me very proud. And uh, as the father of uh, two little boys, you know, I'm, I'm very heartwarmed. You know, I know that they're gonna come into a world as a proud Nishnabek, uh, knowing a lot more than I did when I was a little boy growing up. And um, so, yeah, I just want to thank you once again for all your great efforts. Uh, my wife is named Sarah. She uh, has roots in Garden River First Nation, the other kid again, Zibi. Uh, and uh, she grew up in Bruce Mines, which, which is just a little west of here. And uh, we have two little boys. Jiquis is almost four years old. He's going to turn four in December. And Yabes was just born in June. He is almost three months old. So we've been having a pretty uh, fun summer, um, just as a family of four, welcoming our new uh, bundle into this world. And um, I guess figuring out uh, what the future is going to hold for us. Um, it's been particularly interesting time for me, I think, because I, uh, I switched careers just as... Um, as the pandemic was unfolding really. So uh, to give you a little bit of background about the, the work that I've done professionally, um, I've lived in Toronto, uh, Winnipeg, Ottawa, and now Sudbury. And I've worked primarily as a journalist over uh, my career. I went to university at Ryerson in Toronto and I graduated in 2002 with a bachelor of journalism degree. Um, I got into journalism in a really uh, weird way. I wasn't really planning on becoming a journalist when I was younger. And I think the biggest reason was that I didn't know uh, really of any Indigenous journalists at the time. Um, I didn't know that that was a viable career option for me. And uh, going to high school in the 1990s, you know, I didn't really have anybody pushing me in that direction, you know, which is, which is really unfortunate. But you know, thankfully, I was steered in, in sort of the path of uh, storytelling uh, as a profession. Um, I guess I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about my upbringing and how that influenced my career. And then um, I'm more interested in having discussions with you all and answering your questions. So um, I'll just give you, a, I guess, a brief overview of how, how I got to where I am today and how my Anishinaabe heritage really uh, motivated me and, and informed my own career path and my life path, obviously, essentially. So uh, I grew up in, in Wasoxing. Uh, it's an island community right beside Perry Sound. My dad grew up in Wasoxing, and my mom is uh, Canadian from Perry Sound. She's white. Uh, they met while they were going to high school in Perry Sound, at Perry Sound High School, and um, they got married quite young. They eventually ended up in Ottawa for university, and that's when they learned I was coming along, that my, my mom was pregnant for me. Um, so they were in their, their early 20s by then, and they made the decision to move back to my dad's community because uh, they wanted to raise their kids in an Anishinaabe environment. And they essentially dropped out of university to do that. And uh, they made a huge sacrifice um, for me and my brothers, I think, you know, looking back, it was probably a huge decision and, and very scary for them. But 
they uh, they did that and they built their own house uh, on the reserve. And uh, shortly after that, I was born. So uh, I was born in 1979, so right at the end of the 70s. And as I was growing up in the 80s, you know, I was pretty fortunate to experience, I guess, um, a reclamation of Nishnabe traditions and a reconnection with some of those ways of life. Um, there was a lot of, um, I guess, healing that uh, was happening back in the 1980s. And that was after decades of uh, some serious tragedies and traumas, you know, as a result of being a colonized and displaced people, you know, um, when you're traditionally uh, traversing the shoreline of Georgian Bay for time immemorial, and then, you know, the white people come in and say, you gotta, you gotta leave here and you gotta live on this island now, that's gonna be hugely devastating, right? So that's what happened after the uh, Robinson-Huron Treaty was sort of enacted once Canadian Confederation happened in the latter half of the uh, 18th, 19th century, sorry. And um, our people were displaced from what is originally Perry Sound now out to this island. And um, I talked to my grandmother about this and I, I mentioned the story a lot. Um, you know, she explained that very much as the end of the world for our people as Nishnabek, right? She heard those stories from her grandparents about how they were basically uprooted from the lands that they traveled for millennia and then were just left to try to farm on this island and, and try to make a living. So it was devastating. And then uh, the main industry that happened in Perry Sound after that was logging. So, you know, they were sitting on this island looking over to the mainland where they used to live and all the trees were getting cut down. So then after that, you know, like they were confined to the island, they weren't allowed to leave. And then alcohol was introduced to the community. Uh, kids were starting to be apprehended to go to residential school and so on. And, you know, all the uh, other byproducts of the Indian Act that forbade culture and everything like that just had a hugely devastating impact on, on our community as it did in every other indigenous nation on this continent, right? But after, you know, decades of, of these traumas and tragedies, uh, people got together and decided that they wanted to reconnect to being the Shinabe. And that's when I grew up. I was fortunate to be a kid at a time when powwows were coming back into our community, ceremonies like sweat lodges were happening once again. And um, I was really, really fortunate. You know, I look back to that time and that made me who I am today. And the bigger thing that impacted me, I think, was the storytelling, you know, the oral tradition of the Anishinaabek, of carrying on traditions and, and laws and histories through the spoken word, right? And having that communal experience of, of sharing, which, you know, you've all been doing every week this summer, which is, uh, which is really awesome. So that's what really connected me to my culture. And, and I, I knew storytelling was going to root me in who I was for the rest of my life. And I, I feel really fortunate that I was able to make that connection at that age. So I went through elementary school. Um, our school, our cohort, like the kids my age, were the first ones who went all the way up through grade eight uh, on the res school. And um, as a result, you know, culture became an important part of the curriculum. And uh, we had elders come in who would share stories with us and tell us about our community history. And, you know, our teachers would take us on walks out in the bush to, you know, to gather medicine and that kind of thing. So it wasn't just learning about like arithmetic or, or reading and writing. It was, you know, some land based learning as well, which was great, you know, um, but I had to leave the reserve to go to high school. Right. And um, that was a pretty different experience. Um, you know, by the time I got into that sort of structure, that institutional structure, I saw that there wasn't the flexibility for culture and uh, the storytelling that I learned about wasn't the same. You know, uh, English class was something entirely different than the storytelling uh, periods we had with our elders. So I still loved it. I still really enjoyed it. But, um, you know, I, I thought at that point that our uh, culture, our Anishinaabe culture, because we didn't see it in any books, it wasn't valid, you know, and, and it's really, it's really sad to think back to that time, you know, it was only like, only, it was about 30 years ago, I guess, like, you know, 27, 28 years ago. Um, but it was, it was a totally different time and that, you know, there was no reflection or representation of Anishinaabe life or uh, custom or experience in the curriculum uh, in the mainstream. Um, 
fortunately I had an aunt who, who knew that I really liked English class and she started giving me books by people like Thomas King and Lee Miracle and Louise Erdrich and Richard Wagamese. And that really opened my eyes to how our experiences could be shared through the written word. And, and I did see finally that the storytelling that made us Nishnabe uh, could transfer onto the written word and onto the page. And, and we could share our experiences that way. And it was really empowering to, to see those authors doing those things. Um, I got into journalism in sort of a different way though. Like by the time I got up to grade 12, I, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my career. Uh, and I applied for an exchange program in, in Germany. Um, so back then, way back in the day, like in the, the ancient times of the 1990s in high school, there used to be um, what was called OAC, and we, you know, colloquially called it grade 13. And if you wanted to go to university, you had to go to OAC, right? So I was done grade 12, getting ready to go to OAC. I uh, had no idea what I wanted to do, despite, you know, being an honor student. Um, I wasn't really pushed in any sort of direction by any teachers or any guidance counselors. And... Uh, so I decided to apply for this exchange and ended up doing it. And uh, shortly before I left, I was contacted by a newspaper called the Nishnabek News, which uh, still exists today. It's published by the Nishnabek Nation. And uh, they asked if I wanted to write articles for them every month about uh, my experiences over there. And then they said they're gonna pay me every time they published one of my articles. And that sort of blew my mind. I was like, oh my God, you can get, you can get paid for being a writer? This is, this is wild, I never, never imagined this. So that was my first experience with journalism. And I wrote articles about you know, the, the interesting things that happened to me while I was over in Germany for a year and uh, came back and um, applied to uh, Ryerson. I still had that OAC year of high school to go. I uh, got into Ryerson and then went there for four years, uh, graduated. Um, worked uh, freelance for about a year after that. Uh, then I started working for the, the Weather Network as a news writer. Um, and then eventually started uh, being an on-camera reporter for the Weather Network. And I did that for a couple of years before uh, I heard from CBC about a job they had open in Winnipeg and they encouraged me to apply for it. And I did. So I got it, uh, moved to Winnipeg in 2006. And that's sort of where my CBC journey began. I was out there for four years. I got homesick, so I wanted to move back to Ontario to be closer to home. I went back to Toronto for a little while to work at CBC there, but then a job opened at CBC in, in Ottawa, which was a little more favorable for me at the time um, because I had some family in, in Ottawa as well. So, and that's where I met a lot of you in Ottawa, and I know a lot of you are based there, and, and I'm, I'm really thankful that we still have these connections because uh, living and working in Ottawa was a really special time for me um, for many reasons. You know, I had I had good experiences at CBC, but I also met my wife, Sarah, there. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so I was there until 2017. Um, a job opened up here in Sudbury, and we'd sort of been eyeing Sudbury for a while because it's uh, sort of in between where we both grew up. And, you know, we thought this would be a good place to raise kids. So I applied for the job at CBC here. I eventually ended up taking on another job as uh, the afternoon host uh, for uh, the radio show um, for Northern Ontario. And I did that for a couple of years, uh, but then, you know, all along, uh, I had this, this literary career sort of on the side, uh, writing books. And uh, the last book I wrote, it's called Moon of the Crescent Snow. And it sort of got, you know, a little bit of popularity and uh, so much so that I got offered um, a publishing contract to write a sequel. And the way it worked out is I just, you know, I had to choose uh, one or the other, my journalism career or my literary career. And I've sort of been doing them both for, you know, roughly 10 years, but it um, got to the point now where I couldn't do them both at the same time. So decided to, to walk away from journalism and to focus just on storytelling in that sense. And uh, I ended up quitting CBC in May and um, I've been focusing on, uh, on my writing since. So it's been um, a pretty, interesting transition for me. And um, I'm just very thankful for all the opportunities that I've had, uh, both in journalism and, and in writing. And um, so yeah, now I'm, I'm just doing some research to write my next book. And uh, I'll hopefully have a first draft done by next uh, September, about a year from now. And then hopefully it'll come out about a year after that. We'll see. That's sort of, uh, it's a bit of an accelerated timeline. But if everything goes well, we should be able to stick with it. Um, but yeah, that's basically how I got to where I am today. And uh, I am I am open to talk about anything y'all want to, you know, like from growing up in the res, being an urban Indigenous person, to working in the media, to working in publishing, to uh, 
to culture to anything else so that's uh, that's my i guess really long introduction i said i was going to keep it short but so much for that um but uh yeah just chimigoich again for the opportunity so yeah let's just uh, let's chat for the the next half hour or so oh and i'm drinking water i didn't uh my wife sarah asked me if i was going to get tea but i didn't uh have enough time to put it on but water is good enough yeah i drink water for every team chat so it's <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so what was it like working in a corporate environment like CBC? Good question. Overall, it was good. Uh, overall, I had great experiences. I, in journalism, I was able to grow as a storyteller. I was able to fulfill my goals as a journalist. And um, I, I, I really, I think, grew as a person. But as you all are probably familiar with, you know, when you're one of very few people, if not the only person from a particular community in a corporate environment, it's really hard. It's tough. And uh, from the beginning, I, I dealt with a lot of, I guess, ignorance, um, a lot of, um, push back here and there uh, a lot of I guess just complacency from the superiors you know um, and um, it, it, it's interesting now to really talk about this because um, there is uh, a greater spotlight being put on systemic racism in basically all sectors which is really good and and full credit to the Black Lives Matter movement for getting that conversation going um, it's, it's really tragic that it took the death of George Floyd to, to really get these conversations happening, but they're, they're happening unlike they ever had before. And it is, everyone's calling it a moment of reckoning, especially in the media, right? Like a lot of uh, corporations are really uh, looking inward and, and dis discussing ways of, of confronting the systemic racism that thrives within their systems for years. And, and it's good. It's good that you know the last few months have have seen um, these conversations happen and some change happen. I think change is obviously very slow, but um, you know there's no way that they can't uh, go back to how it was before. You know, like the the industry has has changed, and uh, especially people of color, journalists of color, are are speaking out to a degree that they never had before. So. You know, like when you're singled out, it's it's lonely. It's 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 really sad sometimes to be the only one that you think is is fighting for the things you think are right. And um, I did get a lot of support from a lot of my non-indigenous bosses to do uh, stories like that, and and I did overall feel very supported. But like on a day-to-day -day basis, there was just a lot of crap to deal with. You know, it was you know, educating fellow colleagues about Indigenous issues. It was about sharing contacts with them. And and I, I you know, am really guided by uh, Nishnabe principles of, of um, respect and, and humility and, and taking the time to do things properly. And in that environment, it's not always conducive to taking the time to do things right. So if a, a, a colleague wanted an Indigenous contact from me, you know, I wouldn't just hand over their phone number or email address. I would reach out to that person first before I shared it, right? And that would take time. And then I would have, you know, that colleague saying, hey, where's that person's number? I need, I need this kind of person for this story. And I got really frustrated. And, and, and I would eventually just say, I don't do things that way. That's not how we do things in our community. You know, we respect each other and we respect the people. Uh, we respect their time most importantly, and, and what they have to share with us. So it's it's hard to try to apply like Nishnabe or indigenous principles to those corporate environments because they're so alien, you know, it's, it's so foreign to what we know um, in terms of our processes, right? So it was tough. Um, and, and, you know, as I, I was at CBC for 14 years altogether, and, and overall there were 14 really good years, but I just, I knew I couldn't last because the change wasn't happening fast enough, you know? And when you're asked to help out your colleagues or when you have to educate people, that impacts your own job, right? Like if I had a story to do and I'm, I'm spending, you know, an hour helping somebody else with their story, then, you know, that sets me back in my deadline and everything like that, right? So, um, and at the same time, like if I don't help that 
non-Indigenous colleague with their story, they may get it wrong and that makes the whole of CBC look bad. And then for me as the only guy uh, in that community, um, that particular city who's Indigenous who works at CBC, I got to take that on too. And I got to apologize to the community for my colleagues messing it up, right? So I could go on and on and on about this because this is like really fresh in my mind. And this is something I've really, um, you know, like when, when I left uh, in May, you know, usually I think some of you know me as a pretty positive guy and somebody who's, you know, really optimistic and, and really um, likes to reflect on things in a nostalgic way. And when I first left, I was like, oh, okay, you know, 14 years at CBC, like 18 years altogether as a journalist, you know, like some good memories, you know, et cetera, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. How am I going to reflect on this? Then all these discussions kept happening and it, and it really like opened my eyes to, not that I was naive to my own experiences, but it opened my eyes to just how widespread those experiences were. And it made me really, uh, really like angry in a lot of ways. And, and I, I had a hard time reflecting on that, on that career. And I still do, I still have a hard time reflecting on it. And it's gonna take a long time for me to really look back on it. But um, yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to, 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 to discuss that because it's, it was a big part of my life for a long time. And um, uh, unless these corporations change, then they're not, they're gonna be obsolete in the eyes of people like all of us really, you know, they're, they're not gonna, be able to prove that they serve us as indigenous people and we're going to do things our own way we're not we're going to leave them behind we're not going to need them so um but, but that's all i'll say about that for now but we could get into it a little more later if, if y'all like to um okay next what do you think are differences of an indigenous journalist and a non-indigenous journalist oh big differences um like there's, you know, a, a non-Indigenous journalist, um, and and I, I go back to the principles that I mentioned, you know, like, and and this is this is a very general response that I'm going to give, and obviously not all, you know, non-Indigenous journalists, as as we had to say, not all, everybody else or whatever. Um, but I think like there, the way journalism has been created in this country um, has been about really not serving the communities that it purports to serve. And uh, unfortunately, I think uh, that allows ego to thrive and develop amongst individual journalists and because they're rewarded for the stories that they do, you know, um, it all comes back to the individual journalists and, and their skills or, or the way they did something, right? And that sort of separates the individual from the community, I think. Um, I, and, and my belief is, and I think a lot of Anishinaabek would believe this as well, and a lot of people from other Indigenous nations, every other Indigenous nation would believe, if you're part of a community and you're tasked with sharing their story it's a communal thing you know you're responsible to that community um just as much as you're responsible to your employer and there are protocols you have to take to do that properly but the way that canadian journalism and american journalism has operated for decades is that you go in somewhere and you take a story and you show it to other people and you don't really nurture or maintain a relationship with the people that you took that story from and that's been a huge issue with uh, covering Indigenous issues in communities here in Canadian media, right? So as a result, there's been really been no trust between Indigenous communities and the mainstream media forever, really. And things have improved, obviously, over the last 20, 30 years because there have been more Indigenous journalists coming up. But a, a non-Indigenous journalist will not see something as a community building uh, exercise, you know? Um, and I think as a result, relationships are damaged between media and various communities. And, uh, and a non-Indigenous journalist, really, when it comes to that particular marginalized community they have to cover, they only have to worry about, about it from the time they're assigned to the time that they file their story. Then they can go home if they're a white journalist and forget about everything and not have to worry about that community or those people at all. You know, they can go home to their families and have dinner and then watch their shows or their games and then 
um, get up and do a totally different story altogether the next day. Whereas an indigenous journalist, I mean, like we we live it, you know, as as I mentioned earlier, like it was about for me, it was about having that good relationship with the community. And you, you can't just turn it off if you're an indigenous journalist, you know, you you live it constantly. And especially if there are issues going on within your city or community, you know, those are your 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 community fellow community members that you're reporting on and that you're trying to do justice and that you're trying to keep good relations with you know so an indigenous journalist lives it constantly uh bears the burden of fostering that good relationship and really has to weather the damage of uh, that's created by non-indigenous journalists right so and that's just like on a day-to-day -day basis um i think the path to journalism is much more difficult for indigenous journalists uh you know when i went to ryerson i was only one of two indigenous journalists in in my program and uh the other indigenous journalist had sort of um just recently discovered her their indigenous roots right so i was the only res guy in there and uh of course i had to answer every question about uh, anything indigenous related as as i'm sure some of you are familiar with right in in these classroom settings where there are very few of you so that was a grind and um you know coming up through that and then getting your first jobs in journalism um you you're doubted from the beginning you know like there are people who don't believe that you have the merit to be there um because you're from a community that they're not familiar with and and i think they'll just assume that you came in there as a result of like a special program or a quota or, or something else and you have to work extra hard and you have to be extra nice to be accepted by everybody else and as soon as you rock the boat they'll try to squeeze you out of there and uh, it's really a difficult game of survival. And I learned that really early on, you know, that I was, it was a long haul that I had to do on my own. And it was tough, you know, but, uh, and, and a lot of people don't last, a lot of people don't make it. Um, the reason I think I did was that, um, I, I guess that I'd, I'd been familiar enough with being an outsider, you know, all through my education journey uh, off the res, right? And um, I just knew what I had to do in those environments to uh, to help myself through, but also to help everybody else at the same time. So, you know, there are way more burdens for an Indigenous journalist than there are, than there are for a non-Indigenous journalist. All right, perfect. Um... So another question, how did you start writing The Moon with the Crested Snow? Like, how did that begin? Yeah, it's an awesome question. I'm, uh, I way more enjoy answering the, the book questions <laughs> at this point in my life because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm gone from journalism in, in, in that sense, right? I'm not, you know, I'll still be in journalism in, to some capacity for the rest of my life, but not as a full-time uh, journalist. But writing fiction is way more fun than being a journalist, that's for sure. Um, yeah, Moon of the Crescent Snow, um, it, it came about, uh, geez, a long, long time ago. Um, and, you know, I'd always been a fan of dystopian or post-apocalyptic fiction ever since I was a teenager, right? Like, when I was in, in English class in high school, even though I wasn't reading books by Indigenous uh, authors when I really, you know, would have benefited. I was still reading books uh, about, you know, dystopian stories and experiences that really shaped me, I think. You know, books like uh, 1984 or Lord of the Flies, Brave New World, Fahrenheit 451, etc. And what I really liked about those stories were, was they were an opportunity to sort of escape, you know, the, our current uh, life and, and also think about ways of how our current societies are really getting things wrong and, and how bad things could get, right? And, and at the same time, like, they weren't like really scary or um, extraordinary stories to me because as I mentioned earlier, my grandma told me what her grandparents told her about, you know, their world ending as a result of being kicked off the mainland, right? And, and you know, white people coming in and cutting all the trees down and, and so on. 
So I had that perspective of being an Indigenous person who already knew what an apocalypse was and that like the life we live now is a dystopian existence, you know, like our, our old ways of life are uh, severely damaged because of colonialism. So, you know, that drew me to dystopian fiction in that sense as well. So I'd always, always really like stories like that. Um, but in 2003, uh, I was living in Toronto. Um, you know, it was a year after I graduated from Ryerson. I was working as a freelance journalist mostly, but also part-time at the Weather Network. And uh, in August of 2003, I'm not sure if many of you will remember this, but there was a big blackout that impacted like tens of millions of people all along the Eastern part of uh, North America. So that day, though, I wasn't in Toronto. I was in Wasoxing. I was visiting my brothers. Um, they were at my dad's place because uh, he and my stepmom were uh, away on vacation. So um, they wanted us to sort of watch the house. So we're all there and the power goes out. And uh, it wasn't, you know, that out of the ordinary. Um, the only thing that made it weird was it was the middle of the summer, right? And that doesn't happen that much in, in the summertime. So we're like, okay, you know, power's out, whatever. You know, let's just chill out outside. And uh, sort of dragged on for the rest of the afternoon. And we're like, well, let's, you know, we were bored because we couldn't play video games. <laughs> so we're like, oh, let's just go into town. Let's take a, take a drive into town. So we went into Perry Sound and uh, we saw some people we knew and, and somehow word got around that it was this really widespread catastrophic blackout that was impacting tens of millions of people. So we're like, holy geez, this sounds really serious. Um, so, you know, all the stores were closed because the power was out. So we went back to the res and uh, we started taking an inventory of all the food in my dad's place. And, uh, you know, we checked out all the water and uh, we're like, okay, let's uh, make sure we're prepared in case the power is out for good. So we went out and gathered firewood in case that's how we're gonna cook our food. And uh, yeah, the day turned into night, the power was still out and uh, we woke up the next morning and it was still out. So we're like, oh no, this, is, uh, this might be the big one. So we started thinking about everybody on the res who we should go to in case we needed help or who we could also help with whatever skills we had, right? And it was really comforting because we we're like, okay, you know, um, the, the world could be ending right now, but we are safe in our home community and we're safe amongst our relatives and friends and, and other loved ones who know what to do uh, in this circumstance, you know, they know how to feed each other and how to keep everybody sheltered and so on and if this is really really that serious we'll make a longer plan um so it was really cool and and it was again it was comforting and every time from then i thought okay every time something bad happens in toronto in the city i'm definitely coming right back to the res as soon as i can right um but then later that afternoon the power came back on and then we're playing video video games again in like five minutes right <laughs> and sort of forgot about everything that we were um that we were uh, discussing up until that point but anyway that moment like really stuck with me and uh i thought about it you know i thought about plans that i would make in case uh there was a world ending event and um i my biggest plan was to get back to the res so you know, I, that, that stuck with me and I kept reading books, uh, post-apocalyptic books, and, and I read uh, one called The Road by an author named Cormac McCarthy um, a few years after that. And I really loved it. It was a great book. Uh, it's about a father and a son after the end of the world, and they're basically just trying to survive, right? But after I read that, I was like, you know what? In this story, there's no real conversation about creating community there is no real plan uh, to make a future with other people. It's just these two people on the run trying to survive. And I thought, you know, like that's totally different than my experience uh, of the blackout in 2003. And, and I thought, you know, an end of the world story can be a, a more hopeful thing, and especially because indigenous people have already endured the end of the world. They have that perspective so we can find ways to to create a future and, and keep community strong as a result of that. So that's sort of how, those are the two big uh, inspirations uh, for me to start writing it. And um, I was uh, thinking it through like for a few years after that. And um, it was w when I was living in Ottawa that I really started getting it going. And um, I just, you know, I had the idea in there and I would think about it, you know, like uh, we lived, uh, Sarah and I lived in Centertown. So I'd walk up to CBC 15 minute walk every day and back. And that's when I get the ideas going, right? 
Um, and uh, I started writing it finally in the fall of 2015. And uh, I had a first draft done by the summer of 2016. And uh, I got a, a con publishing contract shortly after that because of some contacts that I have. And um, it came out in uh, the fall of 2018. So it's been out for almost two years now. Um, I've, I've been very, uh, you know, very humbled and very honored by the intention it's, it's received. And um, I'm working on uh, the second part, the part two to it right now. So that's how uh, Moon of the Crested Snow came about. Wonderful. Um, does anybody else want to ask any questions? <laughs> yeah, like, um, so like, I'm a huge, zombie movie fan <laughs> and so I always feel like when I watch zombie movies or zom zombie tv shows or just like post apocalyptic anything like uh recently in like Z Nation I don't know if you you're into zombie stuff oh yeah yeah uh -huh. okay so like I don't know if you watch Z Nation and they had um like this one episode where there was natives oh really cool yeah. but it was like so like it wasn't real like because it was just this one episode uh, and it was I don't know like the natives just kind of like were over after that one episode really, and yeah. the same with like fear of the walking dead they had like that one the one uh, season mm -hmm. but I feel like natives would be like the ones really like leading the response after like zombie <laughs> 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 and like also like there's a lot of our scary stories that have to do with literally like cannibals mm -hmm. yeah. Like zombies. Yep. yeah and so like I feel like we've already like you said we've already been living through that so anyways I was just thinking like like what would you what do you think like a zombie like a realistic zombie show would look like that has natives in it Huh, that's that's a good question. I, I totally agree with you. Like e even with The Walking Dead, and and that was what I really wanted to get across in Moon in the Crest of Snow is that like it's a, a community response to something like this, right? But a show like that uh, just has like one or two heroes, which which again, as you say, like I find that kind of unrealistic, right? Like not just one. It's always a guy, you know. It's it's not just one guy who's gonna save us, you know. Like that that's kind of BS. Um, but. Um, yeah, I think it'd be it'd be cool to see uh, a series or some sort of ongoing like graphic novel with natives as the as the protagonist, right? And there's Blood Quantum, of course, Jeff Barnaby's film that came out recently. That's that that's great. It's like right up, uh, it's right in that genre, and I think it's a really great film in that sense. But yeah, I agree. There's an opportunity to to go a little wider with that, especially like in a series or something a little more ongoing. And, and just to like broaden that discussion a bit, I, I think that's why uh, as Indigenous people, you know, we um, can rightfully stake our positions in basically any genre, whether it's zombie uh, movies or TV shows or romantic comedies or crime thrillers or whatever else, right? Like, you know, the mainstream gaze on us is for a long time has been just about, oh, let's let's see this movie or read this book again about Indians overcoming their trauma or, or, or whatever else. And those are really, really important stories. And those are the stories that really got us to where we are today. But I think we have to sort of show mainstream that we're capable of much more than that, right? And um, I, I think you're seeing that a lot. Like you're seeing a lot of post-apocalyptic uh, fiction and, and, you know, films and, and you know, like it, it, when you think of something like magic realism, which is sort of, um, you know, could be a potentially problematic term for, you know, a genre of storytelling, but like Eden Robinson's trickster uh, books are, are, are becoming a series now, right? And that's a specific genre as well, which is really good. So, um, yeah, just, just sort of to, to take that part of the conversation a little further, I think, you know, I, I try to share with the, you know, with aspiring storytellers, especially that like, like write your zombie uh, film uh, or write your, your comedy, you know, or, or write your, uh, your sports movie or whatever else. Cause you know, we, we all have these stories to tell. We are valid storytellers and we can, we're going to have, like, we have a, a market for all these stories too. There's so much interest in them at this time, you know, and it's only going to get bigger. So yeah, thanks for bringing that up. It's really cool, Gabby. 
Does anybody else have a question? Okay. Um, oh, Gabby, did you have another one? No, it's not a question, but um, yeah, I also wanted to like just mention like um, what you were talking about, like kind of like that that time and like that urgency that a lot of your fellow journalists had and um, how that's like very like contradictory to like how we how indigenous people interact with each other and so yeah it just kind of like all ties into this um this other like um webinar we had a couple days ago or a couple weeks ago and so um in the webinar folks were talking about how how time is really centered around whiteness and so time is always like an urgency, but it's always like a personal urgency. Yeah. Um, whereas like for, for example, like A7G, I think we're, we do really well because we're not really focused on time so much, but we're focused on relationships. Yeah. I feel like that's also probably, you know, something that factored into your success as a journalist is that you really maintained your relationships with community members and it wasn't about time so much. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Um, and and th th that's the thing that we're all wrestling with, no matter what sector we're in, right? Like, we're in a capitalist regime that was created by colonialism, you know, and uh, it's all about making money. It's all about exploiting resources. And as a result, time sort of caters to that time sort of empowers that exploitation, you know, and, and for, for journalists or, or just for or grassroots organizations that are trying to take the time to do that, like external forces that, you know, have more influence than us are, are trying to manipulate us by holding time and money over our heads, you know, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged when I see these discussions happening because, you know, like we're not going to put up with that, you know, forever, you know, we're, we're going to do things the right way. And that's why I really like what you all are doing. And, and, um, and ultimately, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to get out of journalism, because, you know, uh, by the end, as I was do being a, a radio host, um, like, sure, it was great in that we had a little more contextual conversations rather than just news stories, but still, they were confined to like five, six minutes. It's like, okay, Let's cover everything in five five to six minutes, right? And and I would get so frustrated in that, especially if I was talking to you know uh, an elder or something like that. I'd be like, oh, you know, they're just getting started, you know, and we got to end this. And it's because uh, you know this corporation that I work for is governed by time and money, and we have to squeeze everything into this particular window. Um, so yeah, you know that that's why I. I even if I did have to um, rush things as, as unfortunate as it was, I made sure to circle back with people to uh, make sure that that relationship was good and, and like apologize to them sometimes for saying, oh, sorry that I had to rush out of there because I have this, you know, silly deadline at like five o'clock or whatever, right? So um, yeah, you know, that's, uh, and again, you know, just seeing what you all are doing and, and sort of making your own space and playing by your own rules is, is excellent. And I think um, you're great role models for a lot of young people and, and really showing them that there are other ways, you know, there's not just the one way to do things. And I think we're seeing more discussions like that happen. And, and again, you know, with two, two little kids growing up and seeing that, uh, you know, leaders like yourselves are shaping the way for them. It's uh, really encouraging and I'm really happy about that. All right, well, it is 6.57. Um, we're going to close it off. Thank you so much for coming uh, from all of us who watch these after, too. Um, it was really great tea and chat. Great way to end off the summer tea and chats. Um, so miigwech for sharing with all of us. Miigwech. Appreciate the opportunity, everybody. All right, gorgeous.